and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. Today's episode of LA Venture is sponsored by SaaSoft. Offering customized software development for your startup's needs, SaaSoft is a group of top software developers all based here in Los Angeles. If you are looking to build a new product from scratch or if you're a founder that needs help accelerating product development, SaaSoft can help. With SaaSoft, you'll get the personal attention you need to make your product a reality in 2021. Head to sassoft.com, S-A-A-S-S-O-F-T, for a free consultation. I'm excited to be talking with Zach White today. Zach is a partner at Sinai Ventures. Sinai recently announced a 600 million fund too, so they're now one of LA's largest funds, and I believe they'll now be looking at more growth stage opportunities. Sinai has an amazing portfolio of investments, including Carta, Pinterest, Roman Health, Hippo, Compass, and many more. Zach, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I am super excited that you guys have raised so much capital, have a big fund to be investing, and you're based here in LA. Maybe you could start with a little of the history of Sinai. Sure. So we launched, me and my business partner, Jordan, launched Sinai Ventures in 2017. And it came as a function of Jordan at the time was doing investing for a large single family office out here in Los Angeles. And his primary focus was tech in the public markets. And so through that lens, we were able to build up quite a rapport with this family office and were able to make them quite a lot of money by having a perspective early on about some of the larger names in consumer technology that were beginning to really begin to find product market fit in the public markets. And from there, thought it prudent and a good value opportunity for the fund and us personally to go a little bit more downstream and begin to look at opportunities closer to the genesis of the idea, as opposed to when a lot of the value had already been realized. And so off the back of that, we were able to raise a fund in 2017 from our single family office. It ended up totaling $100 million. We've done 85 investments out of that fund. And from there, Whoa, 85. So you did 85 investments out of one fund? Yes. Wow. I mean, we're targeting 30 investments out of our fund. Just Yes. For us, it was sort of a two-fold experience. One was a learning process of finding the things that we liked, finding the verticals that we found to be most interesting. And, and, and the other aspect of it was, I, I think that one of our strengths as a fund is over-indexing for the things that we know and under-indexing for the things that we don't know. And so I think the $600 million fund, while it is substantially more capital, we're going to be a lot more concentrated. Okay. Okay. Of course, I want to talk about fund two, but before we get into fund two, you can't raise a 600 million fund two if you haven't done something right in fund one. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So tell me a little bit more about these 85 investments. Maybe you could choose a couple to talk about. Yeah, I think probably our biggest winner and and the company that most people would know is Pinterest. We were lucky enough to participate in the series e-secondary, I believe. So it was quite late along the life cycle of Pinterest, uh, at least in its private market iteration. Interestingly enough, when the company IPO'd, we were actually briefly underwater for a minute on on that stock. And so that is something that nobody can really prepare you for, especially Mm. as most people in this market have been conditioned to expect a large pop on IPO day. Mm. We experienced the opposite. And over the last year and a half since Pinterest has gone public, We've been lucky in the sense that the public market has begun to appreciate the Pinterest business. That's so interesting. Did you have the option to sell some of that? And did you have the guts of steel to know to hold on to that? I don't think it was necessarily guts of steel, more so than I think we had a macro perspective on where public equities were going and what the proclivity of retail and institutional investors were moving towards. I think that we really just uh, believed in the company, believed in the founders and believed that the business was moving in the right direction as far as monetization and expansion overseas. And so from there, we were able to provide a perspective on it that allowed our LP to be a little bit more comfortable holding longer. They're a very large LP with a lot of positions. And so we were able to convince them to hold on a little bit longer and it it paid dividends for us. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. So you said that Pinterest was a secondary sale, right? Yes, it was. Tell me more about that. It surprises me sometimes that secondary sales aren't more liquid. How did you come to that position and how do you think about buying secondary now? The secondary market right now is one that it's, there's a lot of money to be made, but also a lot of money to be lost. Hmm. I think whenever you operate in a 
marketplace that is not opaque in the way that it, it functions, you run the risk of letting a lack of information dictate where you end up. And so one thing that I do really appreciate about the secondary market is that some companies that have been private for 10 plus years now, I'm sure that you have a couple on, on your books, employees have, have created quite a lot of value in a lot of those instances, and their remuneration for that could be a bit lacking. And so the way that we see secondary markets is that it's a great way to provide additional liquidity for employees, founders, things like that, while also being able to participate in companies in a way outside of rounds and, and a little bit more flexible of, of an opportunity for us. So you would still do secondary in fund too, like you'd still be open to those opportunities? Absolutely. We've never been too specific on these are the types of rounds that we like to do. These are the types of check sizes we like to do. I think being opportunists at heart, wherever we see a good deal and wherever we see value to be created or captured, I think that we tend to pounce on it. And, you know, it's, the secondary market is a market that has been a lot less penetrated by what you would might call the prototypical VC. And so I think that there's still a ton of opportunity there. And how do you get connected best with those opportunities? Yeah, I think, I think the, um, it's a sort of trite cliche at this point, but your network in, in this industry is everything. And mm. so we really try to be as friendly as possible with everybody from the C-suite to an average engineer. And, and we go into those conversations always from the angle of education and understanding and looking to learn more. And you, you know, are able to provide a little bit of context on who you are and what you do. I think you'd be extremely surprised with the results. And I think liquidity in this day and age is something that a lot of people um, are looking for. And so I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity out there in that aspect. How about one or two other stories? How about Roman Health or Carta or some of your other big ones in Fund One? Yeah, I think Carta is an incredible company. We originally found Carta as a function of actually using the platform. So Carta runs our fund administration. And off the back of that, we realized that the product was just so needed in the venture community. And there was this insane bifurcation that was happening between the funds and the people that were acting as custodians of all of their uh, records. And they're launching a platform called Carta X, which will hopefully be the standalone platform for some of the secondary transactions that we were talking about earlier. And now it's amazing to see how they've transformed into an exchange of sorts that will really redefine the way that private market companies are capitalized. It's a big deal. And how did you, how did you invest? You were using them, you saw the potential of the product. Were they raising a round? Yeah, so we actually became uh, very close with one of the uh, C-suite members of Carta, who was really early on in the company, and he had been given quite a lot of allocation. He was over allocated in, in what we was what he was able to write a check into, and so we were able to fill the rest of that for him. And and just again, that comes as a result of what we feel as being overly opportunistic. A lot of funds would have not been able to participate in that way. Interesting. And so was that also a secondary purchase? That is that what you said? It wasn't a secondary purchase, but it was It was common. We weren't the we yeah, it was common, but we weren't the primary purchaser of it. I should probably just talk a little bit about what you're doing then in fund 2, where you're targeting what size checks and what are the things that really resonate for you. Yeah, so I think that one of the general perspectives that we had that we have had for quite a while now, and it's only been exacerbated by the coronavirus sort of pandemic, is that there are cities in the country that are woefully under-equipped from a capital perspective, even though that there's a fantastic amount of talent. And for us, we, both me and my partner, Jordan, are from Los Angeles. There are billion-dollar businesses being built in our backyards, and I think that there is a ceiling for a lot of entrepreneurs out here in the sense that once they reach a certain level of velocity, the funds out here are generally under-equipped to continue to provide them financing. And so for us, being LA natives and people who really care about this environment and seeing the writing on the wall for two or three years now, we believe that positioning ourselves in Los Angeles, whereas we used to be in Palo Alto and New York, et cetera, before, really centralizing the firm in Los Angeles gave us a great opportunity to provide larger checks that we believe are much needed in this environment. I think I saw this stat that there's 10 to 15% of the funding of LA company comes from LA investors. Exactly. Yeah. And that's something that is for us 
That 85% delta is just money being left on the table. What we would like to do is that we would like to be LA based and really give preferential treatment and looks to companies that are being built in our backyards. And then from there, we're going to continue investing globally. We have companies in all across the world, and we'll continue to look at good businesses wherever they might be. But it's also to have a more concentrated point of view and really provide big bets. That's great. When I was raising money, I used to say, take the fund size, divide by 50. And that's approximately the size check they want to write. So for you guys, that's uh, 10, 15 million. Is that right? Where we're going to be comfortable is really the 10 to $25 million range some flexibility, you know, out of fund one, we wrote a $20 million check into Pinterest. And so we have, we, yeah, we have the sort of conviction to write large checks, even when our sort of AUM was substantially less. And both fund one and fund two are single LP funds, right? Correct. I read a dot LA article on Sinai that said, your LP is a reclusive German billionaire connected to Sinai through a personal trainer. It was a little salacious, um, but my question is, does your LP influence your investing or have certain goals for your investing? Yeah, I think we are lucky in the sense that we have a very hands-off LP. He's someone that's put an enormous amount of faith uh, in us and our ability to continue to find good businesses and leverage our networks. We're given pretty much free reign so long as the ideas make sense and that we're trying to vote with our dollars in a positive way and not a negative way. And so... Yeah, you know, he's an older gentleman who, again, reclusive is is a good way to put it. We obviously, like every other fund in the world, has an investment committee that he's very hands-on in and pays a lot of attention to. That's great. And does that lead to more consumer investing or more B2B type investing? Or are there certain um, areas? Yeah, I think touching back on what I was th- saying earlier, we went through a process of investing in 85 companies to really figure out what we were good at and, and what we weren't good at. Some of the Industries that we seem to have done quite well in are are things like consumer technology. We did quite well in in some of our healthcare bets, and we've done quite well in in a lot of our B2B enterprise stuff. And so I think those three pillars will continue to be our bread and butter moving forward. That's great. But a good sort of transition into who you are, because I think that probably influences what what, what you're excited by and what you're looking at. So maybe... Take us back. Tell me about you, Zach White, growing up in LA and what were you like in high school? That sort of thing. Totally. Yeah. So I'm actually originally from New Zealand. I got, I moved to Los Angeles at a young age for university. I ended up going to the East Coast, NYU, and was really enthralled by the atmosphere of New York, specifically finance. And if in going to New York, NYU, specifically the business school, you don't really have a lot of option, creative sort of options to, to pursue. And so I initially tried the world of finance. It wasn't necessarily for me. And there was a lot of issues that I had with it outside of kind of the red tape and, and, and maybe some of the more moral issues that I was facing. Um, but from there, I left and came back to home to Los Angeles, where I was maybe a little bit dejected and had my perspective on the world turned upside down a bit. And so I was just floating around in LA and I was actually had a conversation with a good friend of mine, Trevor Skeet. He's a a guy who, Trevor McFedries is his real name, but he goes by Skeet. He is the CEO of a company called Brood out here in Los Angeles, which does artificial intelligence for digital influencers. And so I was talking to him and I was feeling dejected and a little bit lost. And he said, you know, there's a really interesting company that's actually quite hiring quite aggressively in Los Angeles called Spotify. And so I went and, you know, had a interview process with Spotify. I was woefully underqualified. And so it didn't end up getting the job, but they said, Hey, you're obviously not right for this, but as you're just floating around and if you'd like to just crash on a desk here and just soak in the environment, feel free. And so for the next year, I was able to watch them build like Daniel and, and the rest of that team build what is now a $60 billion business and all of the challenges that they faced. And off the back of that, I was really lucky to be connected with a family office out of Southeast Asia and begin directly investing off their balance sheet into companies that were tangentially related to Spotify at first. But as time went on, the scope got broader and broader. Ended up working for another fund out here in Los Angeles. And then in 2017, ended up coming to Sinai Ventures and and building this platform here. And so you and Jordan Fudge are the two partners, right? Correct. So tell me a little bit more about Jordan and what roles do the two of you play and what's the dynamic? So one thing that I think maybe is interesting context is 
venture funds are only one aspect of the uh, management that we do for our family office. And so we have other funds as well, specifically one in the entertainment space where we're doing sort of content financing. And so Jordan's uh, role is really to sit above all of the different funds that we run and be sort of the point of contact between our family office and the different funds that we're running. And for me specifically, I look after the venture portfolio and manage the sort of day-to-day intricacies of that. And we also have another partner who works on our film financing side. And so Jordan, I think, is able to take a super high level view at all of our different investments and provide context from our LP and, and just manage the that interactive process, and which is great because it allows me to just uh, lock myself in my office and build perspectives on on different companies and, and verticals, which is great. Wow, it's just it's a big fund, and you you guys just don't have a huge team under you, as I understand it. It's just us two, yeah. <laughs> Wow, you are going to have a busy year. That's great. So there's a hundred million that is for New Slate Ventures, the film production arm. So does that mean you've got five hundred million then in in your purview? Yeah. So it's actually six hundred for the venture side specifically, and then an additional one hundred for the film side. So wow. seven hundred. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you've got the six hundred million in the venture investment side of things, um, and then let's just. Touch briefly on the other hundred million. I know that's not directly under your, your purview, but that's for producing films and TV and and that sort of investment. Yeah, I think the elevator pitch for that fund is that the acquirers for content in this time are the same people who are buying technology businesses. They're the Apples, Amazons, Netflixes of the world. They're fundamentally tech companies that are diversifying their income streams and look at the acquisition process of content much in the same way that they would a traditional tech business. And so in being from Los Angeles and having such an abundant amount of relationships in Hollywood, we were able to realize that there's this gap in the market, A, for people who have authentically diverse voices and who have a good read on culture, and B, that there was a much more reliable sort of distribution of outcomes for uh, film in general. By and large, you don't have the long tails of the film industry that you would have in the past and more and the distribution is much more centralized. And so with that perspective, we were able to create a platform around that to, to really capture what's been changing uh, in that industry. Great. Well, a uh, future episode, I want to talk about New Slate Ventures, but uh, you also mentioned diverse voices, which I wanted to ask you about. You and Jordan are both young black men in LA. How do you think about making sure that the LA tech community becomes a representative community, an inclusive community? Yeah, I think that, well, not always the case. My perspective on free market capitalism is that the best ideas will more, more often than not rise to the top. And it's about us not having these internal biases to be able to recognize what are the best ideas and what is not. And so for us, I don't think that we're taking the perspective of 50% black founders and 25% female founders, like a lot of other funds do. I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce our biases around the idea that the best founders have to be young computer science uh, majors for Stanford. And so for us, diversity isn't over-indexing a certain group or types of groups of people, but it is really reducing our cognitive biases on what we deem to be an investable company and really start to hopefully look at things in a more level playing field when we begin to evaluate companies and and that sort of thing. I do think there's also though the aspect of sort of mentorship and and helping out the community, reaching into the community. Mm -hmm. How, what advice do you have? Do you ever go talk to high schoolers who are at Santa Monica high school today, or do you have advice for, for aspiring entrepreneurs? Actually, so we invested a two years ago alongside Upfront in a company uh, based out of Los Angeles, California called Valence. And what Valence is, they are trying to be the social network for diverse entrepreneurs or diverse entrepreneurship. And so they've actually built a fantastic platform that operates part LinkedIn, part masterclass of sorts, where, you know, young, diverse founders and, you know, potential capital allocators are able to come onto this platform and have one-on-one discussions with the people in the industries that they aspire to be in. Exactly what you said, mentorship is extremely important and giving the next generation of entrepreneurs the uh, ability to take a peek behind the, the curtain is definitely a very important 
aspect of, of what we do. Yeah, I agree on mentorship and just exposure. Do you have any other thoughts on the sort of company that is the right sort of company to be approaching Sinai? Yeah, and I don't know how to necessarily frame this without sounding extremely cliche, but it is, it's one pervasive sort of thought process that I've had throughout the time of raising this fund and, and now starting to allocate it is that if you look at the public market, there's approximately half the companies that there were decades ago. And of those companies, about 25% of them have R&D budgets. And so if you take a step back and contextualize that, what that means is that innovation is woefully, is woefully under-indexed in the public markets. And so where a lot of that innovation has to come in is private markets. And we can go into the first and second order of second, third order effects of what coronavirus has, has happened. But one thing that I think the pandemic has really been great in illustrating in is that there are aspects of this society that are still extremely inefficient and don't equally, don't level the playing field equally for everybody. And so as we begin to think about our theses for moving forward and allocating these larger checks, I think it, we really are beginning to start to think about what are fundamental problems that exist in society that we can vote with our dollars on. And that's not to say the next photo sharing app or the next Twitter knockoff is going to be also a, a creator of value. But I think our general perspective is that when you're writing checks of this size, it's equally as important to fundamentally look for the compounding of social change as much as there is the compounding of your dollars. And so Whereas we didn't necessarily put too much emphasis on that in, in fund one, I think in fund two, that's something that we're going to continue to think about. Agreed. And you only live once and you only have so many shots on goal to do something worth doing. Um, I read that Sinai has the vision to be the city's leading series A and series B fund. When you think about being a leading fund, do you think of that with a dual lens of returns and impact? Yeah, I think one begets the other. I think mm. that if you're really trying to compound dollars at the most accelerated rates, your best bet is to invest in the companies with sort of the biggest ideas. And Tesla is a great example of that, right? A lot of people can be easily fooled that the ambitions of Tesla are to be the next great American car company. But if you really peek under the hood, no pun intended, what they're actually building is a distributed energy infrastructure. And so I think we're trying to look for both because we fundamentally believe that the people that are making the biggest social change will be rewarded by markets. Anything else tactical? Like, are you looking at companies that usually have a few million in revenue when they come talk to you? I, I, I think, again, in really just doubling, tripling down on the sort of opportunistic side, the KPI that is most important to us is the direct channels that this capital is going to be used for. And so if a company has $3 million in revenue, they have a very clear path onto how an influx of capital will take that to 30, $50 million. I'm not so worried about the $3 million that exists currently. I'm more so worried about, is this the right team? Is this the right product? And is the market receptive enough for them to get to the $50 million? Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, I think, and public markets have also been doing this as well. I think that we're starting to price a lot more for the viability of future growth as opposed to what's happening in the here and now. Interesting. Yeah, you do see that in the public markets. Uh, if I have time to sneak in one question about a portfolio company, it would be Luminary. I'd love to ask your opinion of what's going to happen with podcasts. Do you think that all of the long tail podcasts are going to continue to exist? Yeah, I think they are. And I think that we're, we're going to start getting a lot more of them. I think a good comp is maybe a YouTube where people had the misconception that it was really just the barrier to entry to being a successful YouTube channel was so high and you needed to have film equipment and understand the intricacies of editing and you had to build an audience, et cetera. I think that we're starting to see the democratization of podcasting in the form of mics are whatever, 30 bucks now and to edit a podcast and put it on through Anchor or whatever else. is it, The barrier is extremely low. And it doesn't become, there's so much, I don't know, what's the other analogy? Like a blogger maybe where where mm -hmm. the top blogs became the top blogs and everyone else was like no one's reading this and they stopped doing it i think that the difference there is that blogs did an amazing thing and which is they 
democratize the access to people's thought processes, which was a very difficult thing to achieve before the advent of blogs. But I think what podcast is really, what podcast is really doing is democratizing the access to a wide variety of ideas. So whereas a lot of blogs really just focused on the author and their perspective and point of view, what you see in podcasts is, especially the most successful ones, they have this innate ability to bring in thought leaders and different perspectives to create interesting conversations. Hmm. And so I think that what podcasts benefit from that blogs may not necessarily have benefited from is the sort of rotating door of different thoughts and perspectives that are anchored in a personality where mm. so whereas blogs you have the personality anchor but it was it just stayed in that general lane until you got tired of hearing that person think mm. and so uh, i think that what what's great about podcasts is they feel constantly fresh because you're the best ones at least are, are giving you a, a slew of different ideas constantly great well of course i appreciate that answer is there anything else in the venture industry where you're questioning the assumptions about the way things are done or trying to do things differently? Yeah, I think that there's a fundamentally pervasive issue in the, in the industry of venture capital, which is that everybody is sort of competing for the same things. And what I mean by same things is not necessarily the same ideas or the same entrepreneurs, but it's actually competing for almost an acceptance, an industry level of acceptance. And so if you're a new and upcoming fund, if you're investing in these large ideas that are a little bit more esoteric and don't have the Sequoias and the Andreessen's backing them, it's actually easy to convince yourself that you're not doing a good job. I can't say that I haven't fallen privy to it before. New me, new year, new 2021. I'm trying to be more conscious of my cognitive biases towards the safety net that is provided when you invest alongside a Sequoia or an Excel or whatever else. I think that in having such a large fund and such a large amount of capital to put to work, it gives us the ability to be the people that everyone else aspires to be alongside. And so I think I'm much more focused on that than traditional VCs making sure that the cap tables they participate in have enough goodwill in them that it makes it an easy pitch for their investment committees. I'm more worried about big ideas than who I'm making money with. Yeah, it's also a self-confidence thing, which is if I go in to all of those big players and show them a deal that they all pass on, you know, I question whether whether they're all seeing something that I'm not seeing. Yeah, and it's nothing to take away from those guys. They are where they are because they have been fantastic allocators of capital for decades and decades. It's nothing to take away. I think what the issue is the people that try to be like them aspirationally mm. without doing the things that Sequoia did. Sequoia, when Sequoia was investing, they weren't investing in companies that another venture fund was doing, and that's what made them feel comfortable. They were really tackling some of the biggest challenges, ideas, and technological issues of the, the world has seen, and they were very handsomely rewarded for that. True, true. Anything else we should talk about about Sinai? No, I, I think that just the one thing that I'd like to touch on that we've alluded to is that we really want to position ourselves as different. I think that our age, our demographic, our interests is orthogonal to a lot of the venture capitalists in the space. People who are looking for young, thoughtful, progressive investors, you know, we'd always like to have a chat. Well, LA certainly needs more Series A, Series B investors. So I'm really excited to see what comes next for you. And thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Benny. I really appreciate it.